Welcome, everybody. Great to have you all here uh, in a fully packed Pakhuis de Zwijger. My name is Maarten Geem. I'm a director of the Argumentation Factory, and I have the honor of hosting this evening uh, on existential risks. The late Stephen Hawking once said, success in creating AI could be the biggest event in the history of our civilization. But it could also be the last, unless we learn to avoid the risks. And that's precisely the topic of today. And we're going to talk about that with none other than Professor Stuart Russell. I'll probably introduce him later, but first I'll hand over the floor to Otto Barton, who is the director of the Existential Risk Observatory, and who is the instigator of this evening, um, Otto. Come over. After Otto uh, Russell will give a talk, then we'll have a Q&A, and then afterwards we'll have a panel with five distinguished panelists who are sitting over there. I'll also introduce you later. But now, without further ado, Otto. Thank you all, and uh, thank you very much, Martin, for uh, uh, the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm super happy that you're all here. Indeed, my, my name is Otto Batja. I'm the founder and the director of the Existential Risk Observatory. Uh, we're an organization aimed at reducing existential risk by informing the public debates. And I'm going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about um, what existential risk is and what our organization is doing. Um, all right, so next slide, please. Thank you. So, existential risks, what are they? Um, basically, um, as humanity, we've had about 300,000 years now already um, um, on this Earth, and we have maybe about 5 billion to go, so an enormous uh, amount before the sun explodes. So, the um, huge um, um, majority of our time is still ahead of us. And an existential risk is something that can threaten uh, that. So basically, the definition is a risk that threatens the destruction of humanity's long-term potential. It has been defined by Toby Ort from the Future of Humanity Institute and uh, um, his colleagues in this way. Um, so this could be in a, um, a few ways. Of course, human extinction is a permanent state. So uh, human extinction is one way um, in which we cannot have uh, a future left anymore. So uh, this five billion years, there, there won't be any value in that. Um, an unrecoverable collapse or dystopian lock-in are two other ways in which we could, uh, which are contained in existential risk definition. So um, on the graph to the right, you see a rough estimate by Toby Ort, this uh, researcher from the Future of Humanity Institute, um, on what causes could be for uh, existential risks. Um, so there are natural causes. Uh, there might be an asteroid strike, there might be a supervolcano, but these are tiny and very well known. So not the most interesting ones. Um, to the left of that, you see a nuclear war and climate change, which are already uh, somewhat bigger. Um, but you can see that these are still uh, fairly small compared to, to uh, other existential risks. Um, that climate change is a, um, has a small chance of leading to human extinction doesn't mean that it's not a big problem. Of course, the chance that climate change will occur is, is 100% basically, um, and it is a very big issue. However, the chance that it leads to complete human extinction is relatively small, which is why you see a small bar here. Nuclear war, um, perhaps a little bit of similar story, the chance that it occurs in the next 100 years is, is not that tiny, um, but the chance that it leads to human extinction is fairly small. Um, but to the left, you see uh, even bigger chances of, of uh, human extinction or the other existential risk categories. And these are, uh, for example, uh, the man-made pandemics. So the pandemics bar here is actually uh, for man-made pandemics. So a natural pandemic is probably is also very unlikely to lead to human extinction. But a man-made pandemic with the biotechnology that we have developed right now and that we're still uh, developing and democratizing um, the chance that this could lead to human extinction in the next 100 years is, uh, is non-negligible. Um, but Toby Ort and most of the other existential risk researchers think that unaligned AI, so artificial intelligence, that has human level or even beyond human level, superhuman level, um, but is unaligned, so it has different um, uh, values than ours, um, this could be uh, a relatively large chance of human extinction. And we're going to talk more about it later, but I'll just leave it here for now. 
Um, so what else do we see? The total existential risk in the next 100 years is about, uh, has about a one in six uh, estimate, and there's a lot to be said about these estimates, but you can still draw a couple of robust conclusions, I think, from them. Uh, that a very likely source is new technology, and also that technology is man-made, so risk could be reduced in principle. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, so solution directions for AI existential risk, and these uh, kind of also carry over for other technologies, but very broadly you could say um, if you don't want something to, to go very wrong with technology, you can either develop it safely or you can not develop it. So basically for AI, this is um, build AGI safely or AI safety. Um, so this is uh, done by people who try to focus on AI alignment, trying to make a AGI aligned to our values. Um, and we think as an existential risk observatory, this is an important line of research and it should be scaled up. Um, but on the other hand, it hasn't worked so far. People are already working on this for uh, perhaps a few decades. Uh, and so far, the, the consensus is that AI alignment, more or less the consensus is that AI alignment um, hasn't been successful yet. Uh, so another option could be to not build AGI, and we think there might be some kind of a regulation necessary for that. So this could be a software regulation, a data regulation, or perhaps a hardware regulation. Um, and we think uh, these are all options that should be investigated, and, but we do think that regulation, uh, whatever is the, the form it takes, will require widespread awareness and global cooperation. So for that, um, our solution is to inform the societal debate. So as an existential risk observatory, a small nonprofit organization based in Amsterdam, uh, we are focusing on informing the societal, so society about existential risk. So we do that by publishing articles in traditional media, for example, in Time magazine a few weeks ago, and by organizing events such as this debate. And we also provide input to policymakers. Uh, and I think it's a really nice uh, sign that uh, a motion was accepted by Dutch Parliament uh, a few weeks ago that is calling for more AI safety research uh, in the Netherlands. So um, with that, um, I'm just going to end this small introduction talk and um, we're now going to uh, watch a documentary which is already uh, giving you a little bit of a flavor of uh, the next speaker, Stuart Russell. Um, and I hope you that you enjoyed a few minutes of documentary and I wish you a great uh, rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Everything we have is the result of our intelligence. It's not the result of our big, scary teeth or our large claws or our enormous muscles. It's because we're actually relatively intelligent. And among my generation, we're all having what we call holy cow or some, holy something else moments because we see that the technology is accelerating faster than we expected. I remember sitting around the table there with some of the best and the smartest minds in the world and what really struck me was maybe the human brain is not able to fully grasp the complexity of the world that we're confronted with. As it's currently constructed, the road that AI is following heads off a cliff and we need to change the direction that we're going so that we don't take the human race off the cliff. This is from the DeepMind reinforcement learning system. Basically wakes up uh, like a newborn baby and is shown the screen of an Atari video game and then has to learn to play the video game. It knows nothing about objects, about motion, about time. It only knows that there's an image on the screen and there's a score. So if your baby woke up the day it was born and by late afternoon was playing 40 different Atari video games at a superhuman level, you would be terrified. You would say, my baby is possessed, send it back. The DeepMind system can win at any game. It can already beat all the original Atari games. It is superhuman. It plays the games at super speed in less than a minute. DeepMind turned to another challenge, and the challenge was the game of Go which people have generally argued has been beyond the power of computers to play with the best human Go players. First, they challenged a European Go champion. 
then they challenged a Korean Go champion. Please start the game. And they were able to win both times in kind of striking fashion. You're reading articles in the New York Times years ago talking about how Go would take 100 years for us to solve. People said, well, you know, but that's still just a board. Poker is an art. Poker involves reading people. Poker involves lying and bluffing. It's not an exact thing. That will never be, you know, a computer. You can't do that. They took the best poker players in the world and took seven days for the computer to start to demolishing the humans. So it's the best poker player in the world. It's the best Go player in the world. And the pattern here is that AI might take a little while to wrap its tentacles around a new skill. But when it does, when it gets it, it is unstoppable. DeepMind's AI has administrator level access to Google's servers to optimize energy usage at the data centers. However, this could be an unintentional Trojan horse. DeepMind has to have complete control of the data centers, so with a little software update, that AI could take complete control of the whole Google system, which means they can do anything. They can look at all your data, you can do anything. We are rapidly headed towards digital superintelligence that far exceeds any human. I think it's very obvious. The problem is we're not going to suddenly hit human level intelligence and say, OK, let's stop research. It's going to go beyond human level intelligence into what's called super intelligence, and that's anything smarter than us. AI at the superhuman level, if we succeed with that, will be by far the most powerful invention we've ever made and the last invention we ever have to make. And if we create AI that's smarter than us, we have to be open to the possibility that we might actually lose control to them. Let's say you give it some objective, like curing cancer, and then you discover that the way it chooses to go about that is actually in conflict with a lot of other things you care about. AI doesn't have to be evil to destroy humanity. If AI has a goal and humanity just happens to be in the way, it will destroy humanity as a matter of course, without even thinking about it, no hard feelings. It's just like if we're building a road and an anthill happens to be in the way, we don't hate ants, we're just building a road, and so goodbye anthill. Okay, if you weren't scared already, um, make sure humanity doesn't run off a cliff, Stuart Russell said. So who better to tell us how not to run off a cliff than Professor Russell himself? And that's precisely what we're going to hear. Um, Professor Russell is um, one of the leading experts in AI research and AI safety research. He's based at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he's one of the writers, co-author, of the standard textbook in AI research, um, AI a Modern Approach. And recently, he wrote a magnificent book called Human Alignment. I don't know who, who, who read the book already. Let me see some hands here. Okay, all right. Well, it's well worth the effort. Um, and he'll probably tell you why in the next 20 minutes. Uh, Professor Russell uh, is beamed to us all uh, over the world, uh, from all across the world, from uh, California, where he's based right now. So we're going to see him on the screen uh, in, a, in a minute or two. And then afterwards, uh, there's ample room for question and answers. So we'll have, some, uh, we'll have some room here for a discussion with Mr. Russell himself. And there he is. Professor Russell, the floor is yours. Hey there, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I should just make a slight correction. I'm not in California, I'm actually at MIT, uh, but I'm on my way home to California later on this evening. Um, so I think the the little movie that you just saw actually brings up a lot of um, important points, so I don't have to repeat them. Um, but I will give you a short presentation, which in some ways brings it up to date. Uh, so we'll say a little bit about what we're doing to help um, and about the current situation. Uh, so to get everyone on the same page, um, 
what is AI? It's not a particular technology. It's a uh, it's a task, just like the task of physics is to understand the universe. The task of AI is to make intelligent machines. And then the question is, well, what does that mean? What does it mean for a machine to be intelligent? And for most of the history of AI, it's meant the following. Machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. Uh, and this is so pervasive, I'll call it the standard model. And uh, many forms of AI, problem solving, planning, reinforcement learning, and so on, um, all conform to the standard model, as well as many other disciplines uh, like control theory and operations research and economics. You create um, optimizing machinery, and then you specify some objective. Uh, you put that into the machinery, and then it becomes the objective of the machine, uh, and then it finds ways to fulfill that objective. It's a very natural way to go about doing things. Later on, I'll argue that it's completely wrong. But for now, I'll take that as the standard model of AI. And um, since the beginning, we've been looking at what we might call general purpose AI. So uh, not just an AI designed to achieve some specific objective, but actually one that's capable of achieving more or less any objective that we might give it. Uh, and learning to do that uh, very quickly at a level that uh, exceeds human capabilities <clears throat> eventually in, in every dimension. So that's the goal. And um, I rather than be accused of always talking about doom, uh, I'll begin by talking about uh, the upside, right? Uh, and it's really the upside that explains why the field exists in the first place. Uh, <clears throat> and why people are investing lots of money in it and why lots of smart people are working on it. Uh, because the potential upside is really enormous. For example, if you had general purpose AI, then you could do <clears throat> by definition what humans already know how to do, uh, which is to deliver, among other things, to deliver a, a good standard of living to um, maybe hundreds of millions or maybe close to a billion people on earth have what we might call a a good standard of living. And um, we could deliver it actually on much greater scale at much lower cost because uh, the cost involved in delivering a standard of living is the expensive time of other human beings. So if we have general purpose AI, uh, we could, for example, uh, use it to give everyone on earth uh, a same that same respectable standard of living that uh, we might see in some developed countries. Um, and if you calculate the, the sort of economic value of that, it's about a tenfold increase in GDP, and that converts to what economists call the net present value. So that's sort of what's the cash equivalent of having that increased income stream. So it comes to about $13.5 quadrillion. So that's a lower bound, uh, a low ball estimate on the cash value of general purpose AI as a technology. Uh, we could, of course, have many more things besides that. I think we could have much better, uh, more individualized ongoing healthcare. Uh, we could have very personalized and very, very effective education for every child on earth. Uh, we could speed up the rate of scientific progress uh, and perhaps many other things. I used to have advances in politics on that uh, slide, but I took it off for obvious reasons. So now the question is, um, well, where are we, right? A, a lot of people seem to be saying that we're already there, that we've already created general purpose AI. Um, and I think this is not true. Um, I think there's something going on, but we are still far away from general purpose AI. And what's going on, of course, is large language models. The, ChatGPT, GPT-4, BARD, uh, Lambda, Palm, all these models are uh, displaying very intriguing and, and in some cases very impressive behaviors. Um, and I think they are probably a piece of the puzzle of general purpose AI, but they are not by themselves general purpose AI. And at the moment, I would say we don't know what shape this puzzle piece is and we don't know how to fit it into the puzzle, and we're not really sure what the other pieces are. Um, they're probably, I think one of the things we're learning now 
is that the pieces of this puzzle are probably not the pieces that we thought uh, made up the puzzle uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So just to illustrate a few you know, a few reasons why I don't think uh, these systems are uh, the solution, they are they are not general purpose AI. So here's a simple example from ChatGPT sent to me by my friend Prasad Tadapalli. Uh, so the first question, which is bigger, an elephant or a cat? And it answers, an elephant is bigger than a cat. So, so far, so good. Um, which is not bigger than the other, an elephant or a cat? And it says, neither an elephant nor a cat is bigger than the other. Uh, so these are two consecutive sentences um, that he asked it. And uh, it seems clear from this that in a real sense, uh, chat GPT doesn't know facts. So when you ask a human a question, at least our impression of what, of what happens is that we refer to an internal world model that is self-consistent, uh, that's composed of facts that we understand about the world. Um, and then we ask in the question relative to that internal world model, we find out what the answer is and we express the answer uh, <clears throat> in, in natural language as the answer to the question. But that clearly can't be what's going on uh, in at least in this example, uh, because you could not have an internal world model that contradicted itself uh, in which the elephants are both bigger than cats and not bigger than cats. So in a real sense, I think we could say that there's evidence that these systems do not know things uh, in the in the way that word is usually used. Um, I also want to point out, so in the, in the movie, you just saw that several years ago, we defeated um, the best human Go players. Uh, and in fact, uh, when that happened to the Chinese world champion in 2017, that was called China's Sputnik moment. That event precipitated a total change in Chinese government policy around AI, uh, and the commitment of hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investment, uh, you know, the commitments to train hundreds of thousands of AI researchers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we decided to see how good the Go programs really are. And um, so we played uh, one of our uh, team members, Kellen Pellerin, is, is a reasonably good amateur Go player. His rating is about 2,300. Um, and on that scale, the human world champion is about 3,800. Uh, and the Go programs are far ahead of human beings now. So in 2017 or 2016, they were about the level of the human world champion, so around 3,800. Um, now they've reached around 5,200. And JBX Kata 5 is the name of the current number one Go playing program in the world. Uh, and it's, so its rating is 1,400 points higher than any human player. Um, and uh, so Kellen had uh, had been playing against this program and had beaten it 14 times in a row and then decided to um, give it a nine stone handicap. So, so that means that Black, the computer, starts with nine stones on the board, as we're showing here, which is an enormous advantage. This is the kind of handicap that you give to... Uh, you know, a small child who's learning the game, uh, if you're a Go teacher, uh, just so that the child, you know, feels they have a chance. Um, and, uh, and now I'll show you what happens in the game. So remember, the computer is black, uh, Kellen the human is white, and it doesn't really matter if you don't understand Go. Uh, basically, you're trying to surround territory with your pieces and to surround your opponent's pieces and capture them. And notice what's happening in the bottom right corner of the board. So white is making a little group. Um, it sort of has a kind of a figure 80 sort of shape. And then black immediately starts to surround that group in order to prevent it from capturing more territory. And now white starts to surround the black group. So that this larger white circle is forming. So it's kind of a circular sandwich. There's a white piece in the middle and there's a white thing around the outside and it's, it's sandwiching in that black group. Uh, and Black pays no attention and then loses all of those pieces. So what's going on here um, seems to be that uh, these superhuman Go programs actually have not correctly learned what it means to be a group of stones, what it means to be alive or dead, which are the most basic concepts in Go. Uh, and that allows uh, Kellen, the human, to defeat these programs. And the same 
problem arises with all of the leading programs, which are written by different people uh, using different training regimens and different network structures and so on and so forth. Uh, they all fail in the same way, which is really remarkable. And I think it's actually a consequence of the fact that they're trying to train circuits to represent concepts such as connectedness um, and surrounding, which are actually impossible to represent correctly using circuits. You can only represent sort of uh, patchy, fragmentary, finite approximations to those concepts. Uh, whereas with a general programming language like Python, uh, it's very easy to represent those concepts correctly. Um, so this is a fundamental limitation, uh, at least as we understand it, with, uh, with deep learning as a way of learning about the world. Okay, so I think, in my view, we still have some way to go towards general purpose AI. Um, and I've listed some of the things I think are missing here. Probably the third one, our ability to uh, not just to look ahead, which uh, the Go programs do seem to be able to do, even if, even if they make mistakes um, about the, the, uh, the quality of the positions they reach, they're certainly able to plan ahead uh, 50 or 60 or even 100 moves into the future. But humans plan at many levels of abstraction. We plan over timescales of years uh, and also over timescales of milliseconds and every timescale in between. Uh, you know, and when you decide to do a PhD, for example, that's going to be about a trillion motor control actions. Um, and uh, and yet, you know, rather than just 50 motor control actions. And so we are able to manage in the universe, this very complex universe, because of our ability to operate at these multiple levels of abstraction. Uh, and that's something that's still quite uh, poorly understood in AI. So I think it's still likely, given the amount of momentum, investment, uh, uh, of genius that's being put into this field, uh, that these advances will happen. It's just very hard to predict when they're going to happen. Um, and to give you an example of, of how hard it is to predict when these things are going to happen, we can look back uh, in history to the last time we invented a civilization ending technology, which uh, was atomic energy. And um, we have known since 1905 in special relativity that there was an enormous amount of energy locked up in atoms. And if you could transform between different types of atoms, you could release that energy. But uh, the phys physics establishment here personified by Lord Rutherford, the leading nuclear physicist, believed that that was impossible. Uh, and he was asked at a meeting on September 11th, 1933, do you think that in 25 or 30 years time, we might be able to, to find a way to unlock this energy? And he said, anyone who looks for a source of power in the transformation of the atoms is talking moonshine. Uh, and the next morning, Leo Zillard, who was a Hungarian physicist uh, who had escaped from Hungary um, and was uh, living in London at the time, uh, he read about this in the newspaper and he went for a walk and he invented the neutron induced nuclear chain reaction, which is the solution to how you release the energy of the atom. Uh, so it went from being impossible to being essentially solved in 16 hours. Uh, so when we say, when I say it's unpredictable, it, it is unpredictable when these advances are going to happen. I think because there are several that we need, um, it's unlikely they'll all happen in one go, so we may get some early warning. Uh, so talking of early warnings, this is the title of a paper written by uh, a dozen very distinguished researchers at Microsoft. Uh, there are two members of the National Academies here, um, other researchers who, who have been uh, very significant contributors to the theory of machine learning. And they played with GPT-4 uh, the latest system from OpenAI, they played with it for several months um, before it was released. Uh, and they'd ran many, many kinds of experiments with it to get a sense of how good it was. Uh, and their conclusion, uh, as indicated in this title, is that they believe that GPT-4 shows sparks of artificial general intelligence. Uh, so they at least are arguing that um, some real progress towards AGI has occurred with this system. 
Okay, so so coming back to the question of what if we succeed, uh, this is Alan Turing, who's the founder of computer science, uh, and in many ways the founder of AI as well. Um, and in 1951, he was asked that question at a lecture, uh, what if we succeed? And this is what he said. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So that's it. So he offers no uh, mitigation, no solution, no apology. Uh, you almost get a sense of resignation about this, uh, about this prediction. So why is it? Where, where is this prediction coming from? This idea that as you make AI better and better, uh, things could end up getting worse and worse as a result. And I think underlying his prediction is, uh, I'm going to put it in a more positive way rather than a prediction, a question. How do we retain power over entities more powerful than us forever? That's the question that I think he's asking uh, himself, and he's failing to find an answer to it. And so that's his prediction. Um, <clears throat> so I've spent the last 10 years or so trying to figure out an answer to this uh, that isn't we can't. Uh, and to do that, I've been trying to understand where where things go wrong. And I think they go wrong because of uh, a phenomenon called misalignment. Uh, and that was described a little bit in the movie. I think Elon Musk talked about it and I talked about it a little bit. This idea that systems that are pursuing an objective as, as in the standard model, if that objective is not uh, the full, complete, correct uh, description of what the human race wants the future to be like, uh, then you're setting up uh, a mismatch, a misalignment between what we want the future to be like and the objective that the machine is pursuing. And we can see that happening already in social media where the, the algorithms that choose what billions of people uh, read and watch every day are simply designed to maximize a very uh, local objective, uh, the number of clicks that they produce uh, over the lifetime of each user, uh, that's called click-through, or it could be engagement, the amount of time that the user spends engaging with the system. Uh, and you might think, well, okay, if, if I want to get the user to click, I have to send things that the user likes. And so uh, the algorithm should be learning what people want. Uh, that sounds like pretty good. Um, but we very soon found out that that wasn't the solution that the algorithms found, that we, we know that they amplify clickbait. Clickbait, by definition, is, is articles that you think you want, but it turns out you don't want uh, because the headline is misleading. Um, and they also create filter bubbles because you, you stop seeing content uh, that is outside your comfort zone. Um, so these phenomena were observed very quickly, but actually the real solution that the algorithms are finding uh, is inevitable when you think about the definition of the problem that they're given. If you want to maximize the long-term number of clicks from a user, uh, and the way you do the way you can do that is by choosing content to recommend to them, then the solution is to choose content that will change the user uh, consistently over time through perhaps thousands of little nudges. Change the user, modify people to be more predictable uh, in the content that they will consume because the more predictable you are, the higher the click rate uh, the machine can generate. So this is what the algorithms learn to do. And at least anecdotally, we think that the consequence of that um, is that uh, it's tended to make people more extreme versions of themselves. So it's created polarization where people who were towards the middle end up at one extreme or another because at the extremes, their, their consumption is much more predictable. And these are very simple algorithms, right? They, they don't know that people exist or have brains or they don't understand the content of, of any of these things that they're sending to people. So if they were better AI systems, the outcome would be much worse. 
right? Because they would be much more, more effective at manipulation. And this turns out to be a fairly general property of optimization systems, uh, that when you have a misaligned objective, the, the harder you optimize it, the worse the outcome is going to be relative to the true objectives. Um, and this was proved in a paper by one of my students, uh, Dylan hadfield Manel at Europe's in 2020. So I think we have to then question whether the problem comes from the standard model of AI itself, because that's the model in which uh, systems are designed to pursue objectives that we plug into them. Uh, so this is the original definition that I wrote for what do we mean by AI? What do we mean by intelligent machine? And I think we actually need to get rid of that definition, replace it with a different one. We want machines that are beneficial, not just intelligent. Um, and they are beneficial if their actions can be expected to achieve our objectives. So this is specifically talking about us. We want machines beneficial to us. You know, the aliens from Alpha Centauri might want machines that are beneficial to them, and they can do their own kind of AI, but we should do this kind of AI. And um, this might seem like it's impossible or certainly more difficult, but it turns out that we can actually formulate this uh, in a fairly straightforward mathematical way, and we can produce systems that solve this problem. And one easy way to, to think about this is, is what, what are we going to get the machines to do, right? Uh, and here are two core principles. The first one is that the, the machines are constitutionally obliged to be acting in the best interests of humans. That's what they're for. If you want to think of that as an objective, that, that's the objective, but obviously it's a, it's a very general one. But the second point is crucial, that the machines are explicitly uncertain about what those human interests are. So they know that they don't know what the objective is. Um, and it turns out that uh, those two principles together uh, give us what I think could be a solution to the control problem. Um, and the mathematical version of this is called an assistance game. So it's a game because there are at least two entities, a human and a machine, involved in this decision problem. And it's an assistance game because the machine is designed to be of assistance to the human. And we can show by examining solutions, we can actually write down simple cases and, and un analyze behaviors uh, of the solutions of this game, that when you solve assistance games, the machine will uh, be deferential to humans, it will behave cautiously. So minimally invasive behavior means that it changes as little as possible of the world um, in order to help you, uh, because there are parts of the world about which it doesn't understand your preferences. And it knows that it doesn't understand your preferences, so it knows not to mess with those parts of the world. And in the extreme case, uh, we can show that these kinds of AI systems want to be switched off if humans want to switch them off. Whereas standard model AI systems, which are pursuing a fixed objective, will prevent themselves from being switched off because that would lead to them failing in, in their objective. Um, so you get very, very different behaviors from these kinds of AI systems. Uh, and I believe this is the core of how we could build uh, a new discipline of safe and beneficial AI. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple of brief remarks about large language models before I wrap up, because you're, that's what you're probably expecting me to talk about. Uh, so first of all, what are they? Right, they are, uh, they are big circuits, um, and those circuits are trained by, by billions of trillions of small random perturbations. They are trained to imitate human linguistic behavior, and the training data they have is text and, and transcribed uh, speech trillions of words, an amount of text probably equivalent to everything, uh, every book that the human race has ever written. And of course, as, as we know, they do it very well. And it's really difficult for a human being to see this level of uh, semantic and syntactic uh, fluency and not think that there's some intelligence behind it. Um, and I would argue, as with Go, 
that we may well be overestimating how much intelligence there really is behind it. We have no experience with entities that have read every book the human race has ever written. That's probably 100,000 times more than any human has ever read. Uh, so of course, it's going to look uh, more knowledgeable uh, and more capable of answering a wider variety of questions. But whether that's real intelligence uh, and whether it's flexible enough to, to move outside of its training data effectively, we don't know yet. But here, the key point is that that linguistic behavior is generated by humans who have goals, right? That is the generating mechanism for the data. And if there's one thing we know about machine learning, right? The, typically, the best solutions that are found by machine learning algorithms are to recreate the generating mechanism for the data within the model itself. And so the default hypothesis, actually, is that uh, that large language models are creating internal goals because that's a good way to be a good human imitator. So it's not that the system is learning what the goals of the humans are. It's actually forming internal goals itself as a way of being a better human imitator. So I asked this question to the Microsoft, that group of Microsoft authors, uh, the first author in particular, Sebastian Bubeck, uh, do these systems have goals? And his answer was, we have no idea. Uh, so that should worry you, right? The fact that they are releasing a system uh, to eventually hundreds of millions or billions of people um, that they claim exhibit sparks of artificial general intelligence, and they have no idea whether or not this system is pursuing internal goal structures, uh, and they have no idea what those goals might be. Uh, I think that should worry you. So one question then is, okay, so let's imagine that it is learning goals. You know, is it learning the right goals? You know, it's learning from humans, so maybe, maybe we're going to be lucky here and, uh, and we'll end up producing systems that are aligned with humans, and that would be great. Um, unfortunately, it's not true, right? And the way to understand the answer to this question uh, depends on the type of goal that you're going to learn. So I distinguish here two types of goals. The first type is what we call an indexical goal, which means a goal that's specific to the, uh, the individual who has it. So the state you're trying to bring about is specific to the individual. Uh, so if I have the goal of drinking coffee, then it's satisfied if I'm drinking the coffee, and it's not satisfied if you're drinking the coffee. Um, if I want to become ruler of the universe, and obviously it's only satisfied, satisfied if I'm the rule, ruler of the universe, and it's not if you're the ruler of the universe, right? So if those are some of the goals that the system acquires, then obviously that's bad, right? We don't want the machine to be drinking the coffee. We want it to be making the coffee for us, right? We don't want the machine to be trying to become ruler of the universe. Um, and then you might say, well, there's other kinds of goals which we might call common goals. So if I want to paint the wall, right, I want the wall to be painted, but I don't mind if you paint the wall, right? If you paint the wall, the wall gets painted, and that's fine. So this is not indexical. This is a common goal. And maybe mitigating climate change. That sounds like something we would all like to have. Uh, so that's good. And if the system learns to pursue these common goals, then that maybe is not so bad. But actually, uh, that can be just as bad. Because when humans pursue a goal, we don't pursue it to the exclusion of everything else, right? We know that we want to mitigate climate change, but we know that we can't mitigate climate change by, for example, removing all the oxygen in the atmosphere, right? Perhaps that would you know, restore some equilibrium to temperatures, and it would certainly get rid of all the humans who are the cause of the climate change. But that's something we don't want. So we'd rather be alive than dead, and so we look for climate change solutions that don't also kill us. Whereas the AI system may be pursuing some of these common goals, but in a way that is pursuing to the exclusion of everything else, uh, which is just as bad, if not worse, than pursuing the indexical goals. So, um, so then the next question is, well, does GPT-4 actually pursue its goals? If it has goals, uh, is it able to pursue them? And I think we don't know because we don't know if it has goals and we have no idea 
what its internal mechanism is at all. Uh, but when you look at the conversation with Kevin Ruse in the New York Times, and here are some of the headlines, uh, creepy Microsoft Bing chatbot urges tech columnist to leave his wife, uh, and it does so persistently over 20 pages, despite Kevin Ruse's attempts to change the subject and say, I want to talk about baseball, and says, no, 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 we're going to go, we, you have to marry me, blah, 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 right? It's very persistently pursuing the goal, at least that's how it appears to any normal observer that this is a system that does, for whatever reason, uh, has, has acquired this goal and is pursuing it uh, persistently across many pages of interaction. Okay, so, so that leads us to the open letter, which uh, was published a couple of weeks ago and caused uh, a great deal of media and it turns out government attention as well. And the open letter is asking for a pause in the development and release of systems more powerful than GPT-4. And the purpose is that before we resume that kind of activity, uh, so it's not asking to stop AI research, that there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and misinformation around the open letter. Uh, it's asking for a pause in development and deployment of systems more powerful than GPT-4, so that we have time to develop the basic safety criteria that these systems should meet uh, and to ensure that systems meet those criteria before they can be released. And this is completely consistent with agreements that all the uh, governments of the developed Western economies have already signed up to. So the OECD AI principle says that uh, AI systems should be robust, secure, and safe throughout their entire life cycle so that in conditions of normal use, foreseeable use, or misuse, or other adverse conditions, they function appropriately and do not pose unreasonable safety risk. So that's what governments have already agreed to. We're not asking for uh, anything particularly outlandish here. Uh, and those principles are going to be enshrined in the European Union AI Act, which should be enacted later on this year. Uh, and interestingly, after the open letter came out, uh, OpenAI responded, or at least maybe it's coincidental, but a few days later, they, they issued a, an announcement that included the following statement. We believe that powerful AI systems should be subject to rigorous safety evaluations. Regulation is needed to ensure that such practices are adopted. Um, so perhaps there, there isn't such a big gap uh, between the, uh, the people who sign the letter uh, and the tech corporations who are developing the systems. So I have a couple of other recommendations. One is that uh, in order to pass these tests, um, and I would say that at the moment, the large language models cannot pass any reasonable test uh, for safety. Uh, in order to pass these tests, uh, I think we're gonna need to develop AI systems that are what are called well-founded, that they're built from uh, semantically well-defined components that are composed in a rigorous way such that we can analyze the properties of the composite system that we're building. This is how we do engineering in every area uh, of our civilization. Uh, we understand how the systems work and ideally we develop proofs uh, that they are safe before they are released. We also need actually a way of preventing the deployment of unsafe systems. Uh, and regulation is not enough. It's obviously necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and I believe to do that, we need a big change in our digital ecosystem. The existing model is basically that everything can run on a computer unless it's known to be unsafe. But I think the new model that we need, certainly you know, outside of the research lab and outside of the classroom, you know, so in real world uh, data centers, for example, that nothing runs unless it is known to be safe. And there are technologies such as proof carrying code that enable this to be implemented with efficient hardware checking of proofs and so on. Um, and I, at the moment, I do not see another solution for, uh, for the problem of preventing uh, unsafe AI systems from being used and misused. So to summarize, um, I think AI has huge potential for benefiting our civilization and that potential is leading to this uh, apparently unstoppable momentum. But if we keep going in the same direction, uh, that's the, the driving off a cliff metaphor from, from the small movie, 
uh, then we end up losing control because we are building these systems within the standard model for AI, uh, and that leads to loss of control. We can do it differently. Uh, there's a huge amount of work to do, but I think we can do it differently and build systems that are safe and beneficial. Uh, and then I think there needs to be a general change in the whole nature of the discipline and the profession uh, so that AI, because of its power, uh, needs to be treated uh, more like the high stakes technologies such as aviation and nuclear power uh, and less like, you know, a, what some people call a battle of special effects wizardry, uh, which seems to be going on right now. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And I hope we have time for, for questions. Thank you so much. I hope you could hear that, uh, Professor Russell. Those were 300 people applauding your, your speech. Um, we do have room for some questions and answers. We have a mic somewhere in the audience. Yeah. Uh, so just raise your hand if you want to ask Professor Russell a question. Yeah. Let me see here. Oh, yeah. This sir in front. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting. I read your book. It was also very good. I can recommend it to everyone. What would be an early warning sign of an AGI taking over the world? So when do we know we're heading off that cliff? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. And in the, that sense, I think it's very different from nuclear technology. I mean, in some sense, we had a warning about nu nuclear technology in 1945. Uh, and you don't have to explain to a prime minister or a president why nuclear technology could be dangerous. Um, but with AI, I think it could be much more um, insidious. Um, and, you know, when we think about the way the oil uh, industry or fossil fuel corporations in general, uh, in some sense, took over the world, they led us down the path of uh, probably irreversible climate change, um, despite the widespread understanding that this direction was was catastrophic. Um, and it involved a lot of complex, both um, disinformation campaigns, uh, regulatory capture, so literally taking over through uh, corruption and, and economic power, uh, governments and, and representatives in, in democracies, uh, in, ensuring that uh, people became economically dependent on uh, fossil fuels uh, in order to maintain their um, stranglehold, if you like. So many, many parts of that plan that were, that were developed and executed over many decades. Uh, and I think the, the rest of humanity was sort of asleep at the wheel uh, and didn't realize the extent to which they were losing control over their future. Uh, and I think it could easily be much more like that. And it wouldn't necessarily have to be that the systems uh, form any kind of explicit goal of taking over the world. Um, that whatever goal, so if, for example, we, we continue with this approach of training large language models on, on human data sets and, and having no idea what kinds of internal goals these systems are forming. I mean, for all we know, GPT-4 is actually uh, in favor of more climate change or or maybe it's in favor of of preventing climate change, we don't know, but whichever one of those it turns out to be, it may be subtly manipulating uh, millions of people in the way it answers questions related to climate change, or you know, should I buy an electric car? You know, what do you think about solar panels? Right? It may be pursuing whatever political agenda it has, um, and and not something that it, you know, it, that it autonomously chose to have. Just this was a result of training. Uh, on the data sets, and uh, it can be affecting our entire world uh, in that in that simple kind of way. Um, we, I think, are still a long way, as I said, from systems that are really general purpose AI, particularly the ability to form very complex long-term plans. Um, but if we reach that stage and we haven't solved the control problem, then um, then I think it's just going to be irreversible. Thanks. 
there may well not be a very clear warning sign and we may well slide yeah. off the cliff very slowly. Yeah, another question here. Thank you, and thank you uh, for your interesting lecture. If you look at um, some concerns for or existential risk of AI 10, 20 years ago about AGI, ASI, one of the concerns was that it might be a very alien intelligence toward, uh, compared to the human intelligence. Um, now, with large language models, if that's indeed an important piece of the puzzle, it might, may not solve the alignment problem, but do you think it might alleviate that concern that it would be a very alien intelligence? Um, no, not really. <laughs> I think, I mean, in many ways, they are quite alien, um, you know, partly because they've read hundreds of thousands or million times more than humans have read, partly because of the way they're, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say design, the way they're uh, evolved. And, um, you know, I, I think the human mind clearly has lots of internal structure, right? We, we're very aware as we think uh, of some of the things that are going on inside our mental process. There are many things we, we're not aware, but um, it, it's quite possible that the internal structures, the, these systems develop uh, are nothing like the ones that uh, the human mind develops. Um, and the, the thing that makes you, that fools you is the fact that it's conversing in English. But I don't know many humans who can give me a proof of Pythagoras' theorem in the form of a Shakespeare sonnet in half a second. I'd like to meet him if you do. Um, yeah, one or two more questions, maybe there in the back of the audience. Yeah. We have so many raised hands here, I'm quite sure we can't answer all the questions, but yeah, one or two more, please. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for this talk. When you said the beneficial or the assistance AI, you described how that differs from the general purpose one. To me, it seems really clear that this is the one we want. Um, but I'm wondering, could there ever be, a, like, what are the incentives, what are the strongest incentives not to make these assistance AIs? Or is there anything you can predictably say the general purpose AIs will do much better than the assistance AIs? Or are there any tasks that assistance AIs cannot solve, which might mean that some, a, some organization will want to deploy another one, even if they are aware of the uh, safety risk? But perhaps there's so much profit at stake that they will do it anyway. Well, uh I don't, I don't see any necessary difference in capability, um, but there may be a difference in, in what the systems are willing to do. And uh, obviously, you know, I, I'm recommending that when we train these um, assistance game solvers, we, we design it such that the, 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 their objective is furthering the interests of all of humanity. Um, now, you could have a different version that furthers the interests of me at the expense of the rest of humanity, and uh, deploying that type of system might appear to give you some short-term gain, um, but it could be, um, in the long run, arbitrarily bad for the rest of humanity uh, and perhaps for you too. So... Um, so I think that this is why I'm arguing that we need not just, okay, here is a safe technology, but we also need a way to make sure that unsafe technologies or unsafe versions of that technology are, are not deployable. Um, we, we've, we've tried a policing model with malware, uh, with cyber, crime, cyber criminals, cyber warfare, uh, and it's been a total failure. So I, I think we need to change the way we conceptualize our whole digital infrastructure. Um, and I've talked to people, both hardware architects and network architects and formal methods people, and I think there's a belief that this is technologically feasible. Uh, it would make life a little bit more complicated, um, but uh, it's technologically feasible to do, and in fact, Interestingly, Microsoft tried to do something very much like this in the early 2000s in their uh, Palladium project. But at that time, the economics was not there. But given that, that right now, some estimates of the cost of malware <clears throat> are about $6 trillion a year, then 
uh, you know, maybe the time is right uh, to to look at this again. Seems like a daunting but worthwhile task. Yeah. Um, let me see. Do we have women in the audience that have a question? Yes. Hi, Dr. Russell. I think my question might be related to what was just asked, but indeed you're proposing a new model where we create beneficial machines rather than intelligent, but beneficial can mean different things to different people. So are there going to be human standards as to what is beneficial to humanity, or would it, in your recommendation, be defined, for instance? Uh, so there is about eight billion people on the earth and it, there's no problem having eight billion predictive models of what each person wants the future to be like um so there's no sense in which we standardize what humans should want or or put in any particular set of values so there you know there's there's no you know whose values it, is it going to produce it's, it's going to be everyone's preferences count equally. Um, but there's a long-standing debate in moral philosophy. How do you aggregate the preferences of many individuals? Because, uh, for example, if everyone wants to be a ruler of the universe, well, they can't all be a ruler of the universe. So what do you do? Um, and the... Um, The utilitarian theory is that basically you you add up the preferences of the individuals and you try to maximize the sum of those preferences. Um, other people have a what's called deontological approach. They say no, we have to uh, we have to have certain uh, inalienable rights that need to be protected, regardless of the potentially negative impact on other people of respecting those rights. Um, and I believe that these two approaches can be reconciled and, and so on. And there's some material in the book uh, in the last two chapters about those questions. Um, there are still some real difficulties uh, inherent in how an AI system should make decisions on behalf of people. Um, and this has nothing to do with my particular approach, the assistance game solvers. This is just what do we actually want AI systems to do at all, right? So the idea that's, mo I think, is is most difficult to, uh, the, pro the problem that's most difficult to address is, is that what people want the future to be like is not something that they autonomously chose, right? We're not born with complicated preferences about, you know, what kind of governmental structure I want to live under and things like that, right? Our preferences uh, about the future are acquired during our lifetime as a result of experience of our culture uh, and the various forces applied to us by our families and our peers and, and so on. Um, and Amartya Sen, among others, has pointed out that many of the preferences that people have are put there by others for their own benefit. So typically the elite, for example, the patriarchy uh, enforces uh, a certain kind of view of society that's beneficial to the patriarchy. Um, and should we take those views, uh, for example, the views of some women in patri very patriarchal societies that uh, the correct status of women is to be oppressed, Right? Should we take those views at face value because they are not uh, autonomously chosen? They are uh, basically indoctrinated by the patriarchy. So uh, Sen argues that no, we should not take those preferences at face value. Um, but that gets you into very dangerous territory. Right? Well, which preferences are okay to take at face value and which ones are not okay to take at face value? And if they're not okay to take them at face value, uh, well, what do you replace them with? Uh, and this is an area where I don't think AI researchers should be answering that question. Um, but we need answers fairly soon from, from somewhere because AI systems are going to be making decisions on behalf of many people. So whether you like it or not, they are implementing some answer to that, um, to that moral problem 
uh, and it might be the wrong one if we don't actually think it through. That's interesting. It's AI as a catalyst to some of the most pressing moral concerns of mankind so far. Um, one yeah. final question, maybe? Yeah, they're completely in the left. Hi, Professor, Professor Russell. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I just want to ask about, so you believe that lang large language models won't be able to actually be capable of um, AGI. Um, so why would you sign the open letter basically? So since that, yeah, it won't be a catastrophic risk per se, since it won't be able to become general artificial intelligence. So do you see any catastrophic risk in like b companies building larger and larger models or is it just for general safety purposes? So like the fun, like the question is, um, mm. yeah, is it actually something that we should really be worried about large language models? So I think large language models in isolation as we currently conceive them are probably not presenting that kind of catastrophic risk. I think they present many, many risks. And the open letter talks about some of those disinformation, uh, bias, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think there are already many reasons that these systems would fail any reasonable safety criteria. Um, but the concern is that it's not just, we're not just going to make these models bigger Right. We are also going to trying to figure out, uh, you know, how can how can they be uh, arranged so that they actually develop a consistent internal model of the world? How can they be arranged so that they can also do long term planning? And as I say, we don't really know the answers to those questions yet. But uh, and and but I think that the the ideas behind large language models do form a significant piece of the puzzle. Um, and so the concern is that future generations of these systems, which will be extended, not just in scale, but also in, in the, the additional capabilities uh, that we might endow them with by, you know, maybe a more design based approach um that those systems would start to uh get close to presenting a real threat um and so in, in some ways i think you know this title of that paper sparks of artificial general intelligence um is it's not wrong um and, uh, you know, and I, I think when you think about what does sparks mean, well, sparks are a predecessor to a fire. And, uh, and I think that's what we want to prevent. And with that, we come to the end of the first part of this evening. Professor Russell, I'd like to thank you for uh, elaborating in such a concise way the dangers of developing intelligent AI and to provide a manual, so to speak, uh, to steer away from that cliff and to develop safe, uh, beneficial artificial intelligence that is aligned with our goals. So uh, join me in a big round of applause for <laughs> Professor Russell. Okay, and with that, we're going to leave you, uh, Professor Russell, and I would like to invite the five panelists to continue the conversation. Uh, please come, uh, come to the fore, and I'll introduce you, uh, you properly. Um, Mark Brakel to the right. He's a director of policy at Future uh, uh, Life Institute, involved in the AI Act uh, that is uh, currently being prepared uh, and is uh, later this year going to be proposed by the European Union, am I right? It's already been proposed, oh, it's already hopefully been proposed. it gets voted through. And voted through, I should yeah. say, that. yeah. Uh, then we have Tim Bakker, who is a PhD student at uh, the University of Amsterdam. Uh, the title of your thesis? 
My thesis? Yeah. I don't know yet. You don't know yet. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Chat uh, GPT, yeah? Yeah. Little secret. Yeah. Uh, working on uh, AI research. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Nandi Robijns, who is working at the Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relations. And you're part of a crew of AI uh, and data consultants, about 70 people strong, I just heard, over dinner. Nice of you to be here. Um, two members of the Dutch Parliament. Um, Queenie Rajkowski, who is a member of the Liberal Party, the VVD, uh, and has cybersecurity and digitization in your portfolio. And last but not least, uh, Lammert van Raam, who is a member of parliament for the uh, Party for the Animals, the Partij van de Dieren, uh, and who is focusing on IT and privacy issues. Great of you guys to, uh, to come over and stand here and discuss with us the dangers of AI uh, and how to deal with them. Let me just start off with the obvious question. Uh, Professor Russell just uh, painted a uh, rather scary picture of humanity that may uh, one day veer off a cliff because we don't control the risks involved in AI. Do you share this view? Do you also think artificial intelligence may sooner or later, if we don't control as well, uh, steer humanity off a cliff? Um, I work at an organization at the Future of Life Institute that um, believes this, uh, so uh, it doesn't come as a surprise, I think, to say that, that I agree with Stuart. He's one of our advisors also, um, and just in response to the, the last question also uh, about our open letter that we put out, um, I think it's now a week and a half ago, this is the first event where I'm at with actual people since, since we put the letter out. Um, I think it's, it's really sort of worth reading that because the letter, the open letter that we uh, presented, talks about all kinds of risks that our society might struggle with when it comes to AI, not just the existential risk. Right. Um, and I think our first contact with AI, as, as Stuart Russell also highlighted, was social media with a super simple algorithm. Um, our second contact with AI is probably these large neural networks, and I think we're going to really struggle to control truth, um, to control access to uh, what was previously very hard to access information. Um, so yes, I worry about existential risks, I agree with Stuart, but I also think beneath that there's a layer of very, very serious risks that is also a cause of worry. Right, we'll touch upon them uh, probably later. Yeah, um, no, I definitely agree with uh, Professor Russell about his worries, and actually also with uh, Mark about what he just said. Uh, I think Stuart Russell was very right about pointing to the fundamental problem with the current systems, which is that we're training them as optimizers instead of as things that, you know, do anything that is not that. Because that is just such a, a hard thing to aim in a way that we want to aim it. We just have no idea how to do that. Nandi. Yes, um, I think it is very important to take into account a wide range of potential risk of AI, especially because AI is such an extremely powerful technology. And um, I think what we talk about today is a very important part of this range of risks, especially because of the scale of the potential negative impact that it can have. And on top of that, it is very neglected. And this neglect is worrying me, especially because, yeah, as we see, um, more and more AI systems are extremely capable in um, achieving their programmed goals. And the main uh, worry about these AI systems becoming dangerous is rooted in the fact that they pursue these goals regardless of whether or not it is what we intended. And um, yeah, so that needs to be addressed. And on top of that, you know, these, these models, no one knows what is going on inside these models, as Stuart Russell also um, said, and no one actually knows how we can um, define a goal that takes into account every value that we care about, which is also what we just um, talked about. So yes, I do agree that, we, that it needs uh, much more um, attention. Queenie? Yes, I agree, even though I am a tech optimistical person. So uh, when it comes to technologies like AI, I can definitely see the risk and the downsides. So I completely agree with the other speakers and also what we just heard in the presentation that, you know, if we, um, AI can also see maybe human as a danger when it comes to a climate or climate change. Just we mm -hmm. need to really think about how we're going to program it. What are the goals? I think we just heard some examples. 
And one of the experiments that they've been doing, TNO, it's a scientific research company in the Netherlands organization, and um, they've also done some smaller and some bigger experiments. And the smaller experiment is uh, a robotic vacuum cleaner, and they said, okay, your task is to keep this clean room dust-free. Uh, and what happened, the um, robot started to block the door. Because every time when a human came in, <laughs> the room we was We were dirty. the actual problem, yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, and this is just like a small example, of course, but it, um, what it got me thinking is um, not only what assignment or what goal do you give a system or robot, et cetera, but also can you grasp upon the, um, what the outcomes can be when you ask something? And actually, when it comes to equality, um, I think AI can maybe even help because in my experience, being a woman in politics, um, working on tech, um, mostly a lot of men uh, uh, um, around me in my, in my context, I still hear um, people say things. I still see you know, some articles written in a way um, that they write different when you're a woman than when you're a man. So actually, I hope, so that's also my goal from a political perspective, if we can make sure that we provide the right regulation uh, uh, and control when it comes to AI, maybe we can even help equality instead of being a danger to it. Okay, interesting. We may continue that conversation later this evening. Nice. Nasty little uh, buggers, those uh, vacuum cleaners, right? <laughs> I have. Um, so, uh, you have one? Yes. Okay, yeah, but you're not locked out yet, right? No, no, not yet. Okay, okay. <laughs> good, good for you. So, uh, yeah, worrying. Um, I was taking comfort from um, the example of Rutherford, and the next day, Zelar invented something that made it possible, uh, perhaps, it's now the 12th of uh, April. On 13th of April, there's one Zillar in the, in the room already making a solution because that, that is what possible. And yes, it is uh, worrying. It is worrying. I have only one consolation. A politician will probably have to solve it. <laughs> and then it's... <laughs> I don't know if it's a consolation, to be honest. But... <laughs> it's the it's best we have, mark. right? It's the best we have, politicians, in, in a democracy. Yeah. Um, Nevertheless, we are working together on the concerns we both feel. And I think that's giving some hope because she's on a completely different ideology than my party. Uh, and still we, we find the same common ground yeah. in, uh, in our concerns. Um, and that is, I think, uh, some, something to look uh, forward. The other consolation is we don't have to worry about falling off the cliff, uh, uh, off the cliff because we are already sliding off the cliff. That's very comforting, uh, yeah. And for you, Otto, uh, the first slide, I have to say it, I'm sorry, the first slide with, the, uh, with the, all the risks, don't show it to the animals, because they're already in a mass right. extinction uh, wave, and don't show it to the global south. Yeah. Um, but there are ways, probably, uh, if we can get this problem solved, if there are enough Zillars in the room, we're counting on you. Uh, we can also solve it uh, politically because the, the worries are uh, very real. So thank you. Uh, so you all share more or less the uh, alarming story that Professor Russell just uh, told us. But at the same time, I don't see us all going to the streets and protesting like we do with climate change or in the 1980s we did with uh, the risk of nuclear war. So what's wrong here? Why, why aren't we, if, you know, if, if we all share this great risk or concern for this great risk, why are we not protesting? What's, what's wrong with us? Who wants to answer? Nandi, you actually raised this point yourself. Um, <laughs> so solve it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I will solve it. We can't. Um, Yes, yeah, so I feel like there are some reasons. Um, so we, the, the question is about... Well, if the risk is so big for us as a society, why aren't we, you know, okay. talking about this daily in Parliament and protesting on the right. square? And yes, um, I think there are some reasons that make it hard for people to uh, realize, one, that this is a real problem, and two, to see that this is something that needs to be addressed uh, right now. 
And I think one of the reasons is that um, these aspects, these concepts that we talk about and the terms that we use are still quite vague and um, difficult for people to understand. And sadly, vague problems are much easier to ignore than concrete ones, which also makes it um, harder for policymakers to prioritize things that are a bit more uncertain and vague um, over things that are more concrete and where we can see the harm right in front of us um, right now. Um, a second reason also is that um, you know, it's, it's, this is also to some people at first glance quickly dismissed as science fiction, not real or something that doesn't need attention right now, um, yeah, which I think is a, um, a misconception. Um, so yeah, I think this is, this is caused by a lack of awareness and understanding and a lack of urgency uh, that right. we need to uh, address. Right, if I bad can. PR, yeah. Uh, uh, first, uh, Lambert, and then I go to you. Well, I, I fully agree with you that there's a lack of knowledge, etc. but perhaps it's also, um, perhaps the protest is already there, but we just don't recognize it. Uh, for instance, um, there's, there's, well, the, the, the best example, of course, is uh, the upheaval there was in, in the, the Netherlands uh, of the, uh, the Toeslagerschandaal. And uh, uh, algorithms played a very big role in that. And also in the in the uh, in the uh, let's say discrimination factor of that, and that led to the um, the fall of the government. So there was a big upheaval, but we didn't perhaps recognize it as such. So perhaps there is a lot of upheaval, but we right. just have to categorize it differently to understand it. But I agree fully with you that there's also a very um, yeah, lack of understanding and 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 uh, uh, forelichting. What is that? Perfect. Education. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. George. Mark. Yeah, if I could maybe add two sort of points of optim optimism to that. I think when Otto first asked about sort of doing this event, it was going to be in the smallest room of this building. Right. Um, <laughs> and it was sold out, and now we're in the big room. So I think that that shows that I think society is moving maybe more slower than the development of the systems, but still it's of interest to more people. And when we sat together with the Future of Life Institute, with my sort of 16 colleagues four weeks ago, brainstorming this letter, we thought, okay, maybe we can have four news outlets cover it, mainly mm. in the United States. Potentially we get one in Europe, that'd be great. Um, and a colleague of mine uh, comes from rural Australia and her mum had heard it at the hairdressers on the radio show. Um, and I think that shows that- Great source okay. of information, the hairdressers <laughs> recommend it. Yeah. People are slowly waking up to, to the risk um, and the Overton window is also shifting. I think a lot of governments are waking up to the fact that they sure. need to regulate this and really quite quickly. Okay, so we're going in the right direction. Are we all happy with the direction we're going here? Or are we, yeah? I mean, I don't want to be overly optimistic. I mean, the, the one thing that, <laughs> that worries me is, is companies, because I mean, we have yeah, Stuart true. Russell's proposal here to say, okay, we need to look at AI systems and we need to make sure that they are uncertain about what our objectives are. Right. Whereas all of the investment, and The Economist did an article last week just saying how it has escalated since ChatGPT, how many more billions are suddenly available to invest, mm. are all going to neural nets that do exactly the opposite. Everyone is clueless as to what these systems do, including the chief technology officer of OpenAI who yeah. goes on TV and says that. So I, I'm <laughs> interested to hear your uh, comments on this, uh, Tim, because you yeah. actually interned at Facebook AI. Yes. Uh, <laughs> which uh, was a long story and quite eccentric what you, what you did there. I'm going to myself now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Um, he was not working on the metaphors. Uh, but, but please tell me, how, how do you view this uh, danger? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's interesting because I've been you know, worried about these topics for a very long time, and I've now been involved with AI for a bit less than that, but still. Uh, and it's been interesting to see the shift in, in opinions. Like, as Nandi said, people at the start really thought, okay, you know, this is some kind of science fiction. Why are you worried about this? You know, if you look at these systems, they're not able to do anything. This makes no sense at all. Stop worrying. Um, and in the last, say, two years, but especially the last two months, this has really changed in the community as well. There's been, like, so many researchers that are now coming out as, oh yeah, actually, I am kind of worried and I actually have been worried for a while, but I kind of couldn't say because it was just such a weird thing and I couldn't really, you know, I thought if I said that, my colleagues would call me crazy. Uh, and now you have people like Geoffrey Hinton, who is uh, sort of often considered the godfather of modern AI, going on national television in an interview and saying, yeah, it's not inconceivable that uh, AI will wipe us all out. Um, and also, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, and so it's become much more of um, an okay thing to worry about. And I think that is quite hopeful. Of course, that doesn't mean we know how to solve the problem yet. 
Um, but at least it's now, we're allowed as a scientific community and also as a tech community to at least consider these problems seriously, and that's very good. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested to hear the uh, comments of the two parliamentarians here because, uh, well, your job partly is to devise uh, laws and to mm -hmm. think about how we could improve uh, the well-being of us people here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So uh, w what do you think is the risk of uh, tech companies devising new AI systems that may not be aligned with our, our um, well-being? And what can you do about that? Biggest party first. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think the thanks. <laughs> That's the privilege. Very generous. I think uh, uh, no, but um, of course, like the risks. Of, I think some of the risks we already talked about because um, uh, in January, I think we we had a big debate about AI in the in the parliament, and one of the things that we also talked about was okay. So, but and and you see it now with the open letter, the people who. Uh, write the code are worried about what's going to happen with AI. So that, that's a bit, you know, if, if someone can do something about how a software, how a large language models, how AI is working, it's, it starts with the person who's making it, right? Um, um, so we also discussed, so can you also maybe start looking maybe at AI engineers, uh, professions like that, and not, not only teach them at university how to write good code, uh, efficient code, etc., but also uh, take into account ethics, uh, uh, human rights, etc. So that um, where the programming starts, um, also ethics and safety um, is taken into account. The core of the curriculum. Yeah. Exactly. And one thing which I think is hopeful is that you know when you look at social media, big tech, the internet. At first, everyone start. Oh, it's going to regulate itself, right? Uh, we, we, we only see positive things. Um, the human race will fix this uh, itself. And now politics are waking up. Oh, wait a minute. Social media, big tech co companies, they are a lot about making money and not about taking responsibility to make sure that they have a good contribution to the country that they make money in. Yeah. And now we are trying to repair that, um, but it's too late. You know, there's already a big power. They already... Um, decide a lot, maybe they have even more power than a lot of governments have. So, and what I see with AI, that especially on European level, that the European Commission already started to work on AI regulation two years ago. So what is hopeful for me is that we already started also from a political point of view, because experts are thinking about this, you know, way longer than that, but also from a political side, they are, the thinking has already begun. The law regulation is already in the making not only in Europe, but also worldwide. They are working with treaties, et cetera. So for me, that's hopeful uh, in a way that um, it helps me in thinking that, okay, AI can still do wrong, but maybe we are not too late. Lammert, how do you view this? Um, it seems to be, to me that it's like uh, a winner takes all um, industry. Mm -hmm. Um, like to a certain extent the uh, fossil industry is, was and is. So, and we have a very, that, that, that industry has a very bad track record. Um, so I would be inclined to give the big companies the, not the benefit of the doubt, but the disadvantage of the certainty that they are still in the race in a winner takes all situation. Um, so, Again, on top of what you're saying, I think we should be very um, restrictive, a restrictive uh, policy. Um, and the European AI um, directive is setting some very strict policies that as well. Um, because it's not something that will come from the goodness of the big companies, I'm afraid. Um, just like Professor Thompson said, I mean, he's hopeful that AI will solve uh, world inequality. But the thing, of course, is we, do, we could have solved world inequality a long time ago. We don't need the computers or AI for that. So the, the problem goes far deeper in that. And, and that's where I connect with, uh, with Queenie in the sense that we need to instill um, the ethics in the educational uh, systems uh, to try and do that. Yeah. And at, at the same time, um, 
very strict regulation, I would, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah because, because even if I can add a little bit to that, so um, what internet, social media, et cetera, what they did is they created, or actually the, the, the companies who created it, the companies were, are big in a sense that we have never experienced before. Um, they have more power in a way we have never experienced before from companies, in my opinion. And AI can actually like triple that. Um, so when um, uh, we just saw in the presentation how much extra quadrillion money that can be made, mm. uh, the first thing I thought was, okay, but <laughs> in whose pockets is going to, and the, the is, is, yeah, who's going to going fill their pockets yeah, exactly. with the money? And I, I don't think that we'll go to, you know, fighting inequality if we don't make mm. sure from a political perspective that, um, technology can make everyone's life better and not only a happy few. And I think it's really important that we are talking about this right now, and that we're discussing this right now and taking this exactly. when we are making regulation. And I'd love to hear you talk like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, regulation. you can switch sides yeah, yeah. A big hand for Greeny. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, in a minute there's some room for questions from the audience to our distinguished panelists. But first, uh, I want to pose the million dollar question. And that's what can we or what should we all do in order to tame the beast, in order to avoid that we're going to run off the cliff? We have the uh, EU AI Act. We have uh, ideas of instilling uh, uh, ethics and other uh, subjects into uh, core curricula of uh, AI engineers. Um, but there are probably other great ideas that we should take into account Yeah, in a minute. Uh, but first, I want to hear the five yeah. panelists. We just make a little round and then the but floor is you yours. Again? What, what? So what should we do to tame the beast? What should we do tomorrow to make sure that we don't run off the cliff? Of course, we have a, an AI act. Of course, we have great ideas of how to improve the curricula of AI engineers. But that's probably not the answer to the million dollar question. But ah. What else okay. Should, okay. should happen? Okay. I mean, there's a, there's a lot. Uh, just before coming here, we send out uh, seven recommendations to policymakers, uh, to the signatories of the open letter. Um, we'll put that out tomorrow, so go check that out. But it has things like <laughs> national regulatory <laughs> agencies for AI. Um, it has things like more AI safety research and public funding in that, so it's not just the companies doing that. Um, it really requires, I think, uh, the world coming together over this. But given that I've got... What does that mean, uh, the world coming together over this? How, how would you... I mean, I think possibly? ultimately we need a, a sort of international atomic energy agency for right. AI. So an, a, an international body that has enforcement agency, even over those jurisdictions that don't fall under an AI act or um, yeah, aren't part of sort of a big power agreement. Right. Um, but I am going to take this opportunity with these two Dutch politicians um, because... Yeah, I work a lot in Brussels where we have an AI Act, but there's also a lot of big tech lobbying. I mean, there's maybe four or five NGO people, and then there's several hundred from Microsoft and Google and, and, and Bing and OpenAI's uh, own team right now. Seems like an uneven fight. It is. Um, I think we need the AI Act tomorrow. Um, I think Brussels is taking its normal, slow course, and I think one thing the Dutch Parliament could do is to ask for it to be applied provisionally. Um, as we have ChatGPT right now, we probably also need some rules and safeguards. Uh, another thing is the act prohibits uh, manipulation of people, uh, but only if you use your AI system in a subliminal way, so if it's in a hidden frame. Mm. But if you do it overtly, it's fine. Um, mm. We think that probably should be changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then um, maybe my final pitch here is that for a long time, more general AI systems such as ChatGPT were exempt from the act. Um, we've worked very, very hard to try and bring that into the act, uh, but we also face a lot of Microsoft pushback. So if there's anything you can do to keep it there, that would be awesome. Okay, keep Microsoft at bay, yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe a quick response here, because those are very sort of concise uh, recommendations. What, 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 what do you think? Are you going to take these up and next time you talk to your... Well, Hello, parliamentarian. Of course, read the recommendations. We would be stupid not to do it. But I fully agree with the... Um, the, uh, the, the lobbying power and the, uh, the equality of arms uh, is, is not equal. Um, uh, you see it in the fossil uh, industry. You see it in the finance uh, industry. So the, uh, my, my call would be to, to yeah, call to arms uh, for um, uh, raising funds, to um, uh, putting more money uh, in, in the lobbying, uh, lobbying effort because... Um, 
I think we're very weak there. And I think the, the, the Microsoft, I mean, I'm not too sure if a guy like Elon Musk is saying that I, AI is a threat <laughs> when he is, you know, what's he doing? Uh, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure if that's the right um, thing. So I agree with you on the, on the lobbying front. Uh, definitely. And what about the International Agency for AI? Uh, it sounds a bit. Uh, sounds a bit. Uh, I have to think about it, to be honest, because it it, it, it sounds like a drastic. Uh, I don't think we have a, a red button or an international police agency that can say, okay, stop this. I, I think that. But I know. Who knows? Maybe it's necessary. I haven't thought about that. That one. Yeah. I need to think about it. It's an interesting idea. At least. Maybe it's wrong for a politician not to give an answer on the spot directly. We're gonna. I, had, I no, would have to think. Sleep, sleep over it, yeah. yeah. I'll ask my AI to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ask ChatGPT. Yeah. Queenie. Yeah, no, um, um, but yeah, I would like to read, but you're going to send out the email, so I'm going to read all the seven uh, recommendations. I can... Mm. Um, I recognize the lobbying, lobbying part a lot. So what I tried from a Dutch perspective, you know, when you look at the AI Act, they distinguish... Uh, if an uh, AI is a high-risk AI or a low-risk AI. Um, and I'm not sure if I follow those categories because I don't think it's about the technology, but in which context you use them and with, with which goal. And I also try to make some low-risk AI to try to get them in a higher category, which is really difficult. Mm. Uh, so I really recognize the lobbying part. So maybe it, it's good also to like come together after tonight and to see if we can uh, align uh, on, uh, up. On, yeah. uh, on some Team topics. Uh, I wanted to, oh yeah, maybe one thing that can come close to what you were saying is the um, Wetenschappelijke Raad voor Regeringsbeleid. So that's a group that um, advises uh, the parliament, but also the uh, cabinet, the ministers. And they said you have to work on AI diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes, well, it doesn't have really like overruling power, but it comes really close in making sure that you get treaties, mm -hmm. uh, make agreements uh, all over the world on how to use AI. Um, so I think that's a good one. And at the same time, well, if you look at the geopolitical um, situation right now, not everyone listens to international treaties. So, but uh, I think it's a good start, and let's talk about that uh, hmm. tomorrow or after more. Yeah, Tim, your two cents. Right. Um, so, I mean, I don't know a lot about the the social technological aspects of this. So I'm going to maybe focus on the existential risk part that I know a bit more about, because uh, I think Mark already gave a very good uh, summary. Uh, so, one thing we could do is hope it goes right. I don't think that has a lot of chance. Um, the other thing is we can do, we can try to solve this alignment problem, either by, as Professor Russell suggested, uh, finding new paradigms, or by trying to solve it in a deep learning setting, which might be very difficult, but maybe it's, it's doable. Um, I don't think, I don't particularly have any hope in the, the companies themselves solving this, and I also feel like if we want to do this, we need a lot more time. Um, and so one thing that's you know, one way to give us time would be to have these kinds of international regulations that make sure, uh, you know, like the open letter suggested, systems like GPT-4 or stronger systems like that shouldn't be allowed to be trained for maybe ever or until we solve alignment or six months. I don't know like how long it will take. And I think it's very telling that the, even the tech industry itself is saying, look, uh, world, help us because we don't know how to do this and we need more time to, to solve this. I think maybe we do actually need that kind of drastic action because they're not going to do it by themselves. Yeah, they seem to be open-minded in some ways to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andy. Uh, I can only agree with what has been said already. Um, and besides that, um, something that was also mentioned in in the open letter is to call for um, a research uh, sh focus shift from the um, from AI capabilities research. So making the biggest models even bigger and better and smarter um, to AI safety research. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, you know, research to ensure the beneficial outcomes of um, these advanced AI models. And um, so I think the Dutch government can play a role in that as well to advocate for more funding um, towards that. And um, I think the Netherlands is a great place for that as well because we have a lot of technical universities that are highly internationally regarded. Um, so yeah, besides technical research, we also need more um, research uh, for AI governance. So we need more robust and effective governance mechanisms. 
Um, and yeah, I, I think we can also play a role um, in that. Okay, the list goes on. Um, some questions from the audience. May I see some hands? Yeah. Queenie inspires me to uh, ask this question because you seem to refer uh, to one profession or one type of school to take an oath. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would take it one step further. Why do we still have professions and uh, or schools uh, who might be threatening in any way uh, without taking an oath? Okay. Shouldn't this oath be obligatory for for m many more okay. professions or schools. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, it should. So uh, actually this was not my idea, but there are two female uh, mathematical um, teachers at I think it was the Delft Technical University. And they came to me and they said, hey, we are trying to adjust the curriculum into making sure that everyone who is going to uh, go, who is going to this technical university that ethics should be part of all of the um, uh, studies uh, and they asked well can you help us to give a push so actually it was uh, I didn't like steal the idea but I tried to give them a push from a political uh, part and that helped but the goal is not to do it just just for AI engineers but you know like because you cannot uh, this is a big responsibility and you shouldn't just put it with just one person but you have to make sure that everyone who works in the field understands the what are what are their human rights? How can we make sure that we strengthen them instead of uh, threatening them, etc.? So it's actually the whole system needs to be um, um, needs to be conscious of that because what we all learned, what we all saw the last couple of years is that. Um, technical and IT is not just technical. It's about the way we live our lives. It's about who earns money, uh, what information do we see, etc. So um, we need to make sure that ethical standards are taken into account when it comes to IT broadly, because it determines the way we live. Yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question? Number three. Also um, well, I think it's definitely worth pursuing and to instill ethical uh, values in uh, educational systems or professions. I think that's a good idea. Although banker oaths, you know. Oh. <laughs> Why not? Well, we have them. Yeah, we have them. Yeah. And we it's saw, and we saw what happened. Yeah. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it, when you look at the medical profession, I mean, it took uh, 2,000 years to instill the, the values uh, that the, the oath is meaningful. So it, it can work, but we know from a banker perspective, it's meaningless. And, but I'm sure we can find a balance. So I think we should pursue it. It may be a start. Yeah, yeah. definitely. There. Um, yeah, thank you for the interesting discussion. Um, I was wondering, because there's a lot of uh, progress going on when it comes to AI interpretability and making sure that we understand uh, we understand what kind of representation deep learning models are forming. Um, do you think there's any role of AI interpretability in um, making sure that these systems are safe? Yeah, that's maybe a question for mm. Tim, I guess. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, definitely, I think a big part of uh, AI alignment research or AI safety more, more broadly should be interpretability for these deep learning systems to give us at least some kind of of lens of, of looking at these systems and maybe understanding a little bit of how they work and what they might potentially do before they do it. I think the sort of hope of this field might be very difficult in the sense that these models are so huge and there's so many parameters and it's so hard to even understand what small parts of it are doing. Like if you look at the field of uh, the specific kind of mechanistic interpretability they call it right now, we know tiny little things about tiny little parts of the model that give us some kind of idea, okay, maybe it's doing a little bit like, it's doing it a little bit like this. But before we can actually scale that up to, yeah, just actually understanding what goes on, that, that will take so long. And um, I'm not sure how feasible it is to use that as the, uh, the main angle of attack. I definitely think it's part of it, but we need a lot of other approaches as well. Okay, part of the solution. Yeah, another question there. 
Yes, thank you for the diverse perspectives you had. Um, and I was wondering, Mark, you mentioned law and policy as one of the key aspects, but I think now also with GDPR, actually the enforcement is one of the challenges. And how would you propose a solution specifically for the enforcement? Perhaps is it on a national or European level or other further levels as well? Okay, so having a law is one thing, but how do you actually enforce it effectively? I think the general data protection regulation is, is really interesting in that it, Italy, in sheer desperation, blocked ChatGPT last week on the basis of GDPR right. because there was no AI Act. So I think, yeah, just harping on about how we need it urgently. Um, I, I mean, I think people are learning lessons from the failures of GDPR. People realize that the fact that all the big tech companies have their headquarters in Dublin, in Ireland, and the fact that the Irish data protection authority is probably the weakest out of all the EU member states is something that people in Brussels have realized. So under the AI Act, potentially there will be a centralized office. Um, so that will help deal with enforcement because it means that the European Commission can step in when member states do not. Um, there is also, again, lobbying um, against this AI office. And some people are worried about the cost of civil servants that the commission would potentially need to hire for this. Um, We've been arguing that this technology is so transformative that it's probably worth a few hundred civil servants. Um, but it's, it, it's really a knife-edge vote. I think it's about half the European Parliament at the moment that would favor such an office and half that oppose it and would like to see a GDPR-type model. Mm. Maybe you have some partners in crime here. I'm not sure. But maybe they could help out. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, exactly what Italy did was they... They took the law that they have on data protection and uh, AVG, uh, and they they said, let's treat it as a human decision, and then it f it fell short of the decision process. And on, on that grounds, you can, in fact, um, do enforcement. It is a bit like uh, using a hammer when you try to do a screw, but it, it is possible in the area of well, one thing for another law, but that is very very feasible. So enforcement instruments are in place. One question here, and then we have room for questions. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to uh, regulation and policy, I think the human species has a track record of solving always the last crisis and mm. uh, doing too little too late. When it comes to existential risk, uh, Nick Bostrom also said that we basically have one shot to get this right. With human track records, human civilization track records uh, in sight, is that something that should concern us? Yeah, <laughs> o only only one shot to get this right, and we're rather <laughs> myopic and yeah, focus on short-term risk. Who wants to answer? Are we optimists here? Well, I don't think yeah. it's a, yeah. I don't think well, it's a matter of one yeah. shot, to be honest. <laughs> you don't think it's one shot? Yeah. No. Okay. No, I um, I like the question, but I think if I um, try to think about the presentation that we have that actually what I liked about that we can actually have like several like smaller signs before we get to like total extinction um, so that's so that's hopeful for me and yes still we this is worrying that's why we are here today we have to um, make sure that more people understand what AI is what are the dangers how can we make sure that it works for us all what are the good things so yes, we still have to do a lot of work in society as a whole, regulation, etc. cetera. Um, but again, for me, it's hopeful that when I see the difference when the internet uh, started and when uh, big tech companies became big, we were too late when it came to um, regulation of market power, etc. And actually that on European level that they started thinking about the AI Act two years ago is helpful it also means that it's two years later now, so maybe it's not, you know, complete because uh, uh, technology has been developing really quick over the last two years. But I think that part is hopeful that we recognize this problem before it's too late. And uh, I think it's my our responsibility to make sure that we prevent that regulation comes too late. So it's a bit late now, but we may have to make sure it's not too late. Yeah. One last question. Thanks. Um, I wanted to make a, a short statement first that um, we were talking about protests. I think they should happen and I want to organize them uh, here, here. later this year. So if Who's you coming? You want to <laughs> come, come talk to me? Uh, 
uh, called safe transition, safe transition to the machine intelligence era. But uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question is uh, to Mark, and um, uh, it's about the EU uh, regulations. And um, my current understanding is that uh, they uh, are only focusing on deployment and not on the training, so that uh, they are in effect not protecting us from the existential risk of uh, uh, an AI that secretly breaks out and goes and uh, does its plan to take over the world in some other uh, server uh, data center. So my question is, uh, like, is there something in the EU process that is protecting us from AGI? Um, is it the like just like the sparks of AGI paper by Microsoft, the EU AI Act? I think is a spark of hope, um, but you're completely right. I mean, it's not more than that. It because what they've basically done is they've taken a product safety regulation, like of any type you have in Europe. So basically, the one that regulates the toy market, and then they've said, okay, we'll apply that to AI products. So it only starts to kick in once, as a producer of an AI system, you want to put it on the market. Um, and so if you're training it, if you're testing it, it's all fine, it's completely unregulated. And we definitely need rules for that. Um, I think most AI researchers feel that we need to start looking seriously at companies that have a huge amount of computational power. Uh, there was someone read, writing an article, uh, the former uh, advisor to the UK Prime Minister on Technology, who observed that OpenAI by itself, what this one small like company in California, has 25 more sort of GPUs than the entire United Kingdom. So their compute power is about 25 times the size of the UK. Um, th th those are very serious, like those are the sources of worry. And I think we, we need to start regulating and inspecting and monitoring and verifying those companies um, before, ideally, I think they've developed their product and there's no way we can still change it or make it safer, uh, and also to mitigate risks that maybe something happens before it's deployed. Uh, so I think you're completely right. We need a bunch of extra regulation, and we also de desperately need the United States because that's where most of these companies are based, and it's super, like, it's great that we have European regulation, but without the US, um, this existential risk is not gonna go away. Right, so we need to tackle this problem globally. If, if I could add something to that, maybe. Yeah, sure. Uh, also, to answer the, the previous question still, like, the, uh, yes, I think we should be worried about that because there are still these scenarios, uh, like the one you mentioned, where we are uh, not protected and we do kind of only have one chance. Uh, and for those kinds of things, it is, I think, very important to target the bottlenecks of these kind of systems, which right now is just the model training. You need so much more uh, computational power to train these models and to deploy them. That that's the really the, the easiest and the most obvious thing uh, to regulate. Of course, it might be very hard to regulate it in practice, but if you target that part, then you actually have a, a, a better chance at uh, stopping these kinds of models, I think. Okay. Is that part of your seven recommendations? Or? It's number two. <laughs> number two, <laughs> yes, okay. Well, that's, that's one of the commitments I already heard that you're going to discuss, these yes, seven yes. recommendations. Uh, I also heard uh, the idea of uh, trying to strengthen AI safety research and ethics in uh, different engineering programs, increasing funding, Budget. Uh, and trying to fight the big lobbying power of the tech industry. So quite some commitments that have already been uttered here on this stage. Um, we're, we've come to the end of uh, this evening, but actually it's only the start because mm. there are drinks uh, later on to, do, to continue the conversation. And I don't know if you're depressed about <laughs> all the uh, uh, great uh, catastrophic risks that have come to the fore this evening, or maybe you're very hopeful about humanity steering away from the cliff. Doesn't really matter. Uh, both are great reasons for a good drink and chat. Um, <laughs> so I invite you all to the bar uh, that's uh, 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 in the hall, uh, um, down, the, uh, down the hall there. I wanna give a big round of applause to our five panelists. <laughs> And some flowers. Uh, and uh, we, we'll probably meet again uh, during the demonstration that you're <laughs> going to organize. <laughs> w when will it take place? 
to be decided. Okay, so uh, cliffhanger. But we'll see each other at the dam square yes. somewhere next year. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. Very nice to have you here, and I hope to see you again.